grab a beer and then we're good to go. All right. Awesome. Well, what up and welcome back to another Malazan Book of the Fallen video. This time I'm joined and am excited because I actually managed to be the first one to rope uh, Raph Blue Tax onto my channel uh, before anyone else could for a collaboration on Memories of Ice. Raph, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me on, man. It's I'm like a, a big honor. fan of, of Raf's channel and uh, it, I'll put links below for you to go subscribe and all that stuff. But for those who, who haven't had the pleasure of stumbling on, tell us a little bit about yourself, about your channel, because you are a little bit ahead of me. You just finished Memories of Ice and are starting on, well, I guess you're almost halfway through House of Chains by now. <laughs> yeah, I'm going really fast right now because of the lockdown. So Basically, at the moment, I'm doing my third read through of the Malazan Book of the Fallen, of the like the main 10 books. I've read most of the other stuff once by now, but this one is like my third read through. And I'm trying to do like a daily update on how far I've come with it. Yeah. To mostly document, like help myself to actually read it more actively or more, yeah, consciously in a way. Yeah. And then I'll do, then I'm doing some you know, more abstract stuff on like the weekends. I do some more abstract ma mainstream Malazan kind of things and sometimes some other book reviews, recommendations kind of things around that. But mostly I'm doing the big Malazan read through at the moment. Um, yeah, at House of Chains, I just started book three of House of Chains last night. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you're cooking because I haven't even watched your um, second House of Chains video yet. So but I like the weekend stuff, too. Like that's stuff that I like personally enjoy just because I, I love the Malazan focus stuff, too. Um, but, you know, I love that stuff because I, I feel like that gives me exposure to something that I would never um you know, fine. And I have like such a long list of TBRs just from, you know, books that you bring up, like in, in kind of tangentially talking about the books or whatever. That's, uh, that's really cool. So I recommend everybody um, go, go check out Raf's channel and subscribe because it's like a, a real treat. What about memories of ice though? Because we, we just, you know, well, I'm just now finishing up, but I'm still trying to catch up on my my videos. But I figured this would be like kind of something I could stick in the middle where we talk about all the delicious spoilery goodness. And I guess everybody should bail out if you haven't finished Memories of Ice by now. Um, but I, yeah. I I thought it would be cool to stick that in as kind of a bonus for everybody. This is one of the most beloved books. I feel like if you go on Facebook or whatever, like everybody goes, Oh yeah. Memories of ice is the one uh, that I love the most. I'm curious what you think just about where it falls kind of in the, in the pantheon of all the Malazan books and, and what's your, you know, how do you rank it? And what do you think about it? Oh boy. I'm, I'm really not good with ranking stuff. It's, it's something I really Neither. struggle with in general. <laughs> For me, I would say Memories of Ice is more in the middle yeah. rankings for me because, like, my, my favorite one, I think, is probably Midnight Tides. Uh huh. Um, or, yeah, Midnight Tides and probably also like Reaper Scale is also high up Big. there, Told yeah. Downs up there. Memories of Ice was almost a bit more straightforward for me. And I'm like, I like the more complicated shit. <laughs> and yeah. that's so memories of ice is rather straightforward but this time around i i picked up a lot more this time around that i felt was like interesting to look at and also that lays a lot of groundwork for the later stuff i i think that's like the main thing that i took away from it this time around and um, there's obviously a lot going on there anyway but yeah no i i agree and that's kind of i you're a man after my own heart because that's kind of where i i fall in in terms of all the the rankings i'm a big midnight tides reaper's gale told the hounds i you know that's that's my style so i think we're we're mind melding there but that's kind of what i enjoyed too about this time is that you know a the i think you're right the plot line is more um kind of a to z straight line for you know bad guy defeat him kind of thing um yeah that makes it a little you know more approachable i guess or more you know less jarring because it's more what you expect just from a book right but then there's <laughs> yeah. just so much like on the stuff that's not even about the the memories vice plotline it's about all the other stuff for later in the books 
Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I guess why a lot of people rank it so high is that Memories of Ice is kind of the book where you realize what the main plot will be because yes. neither in Dead House Gates nor Gardens of the Moon there's a lot of mentioning of the crippled god. I mean, it, it yeah. shows up here and there, but Memories of Ice with that prologue and everything is like where you actually finally get to learn who the big bad or like main adversary at the moment is I, I think adversary is actually a good word for him because he's i don't want to call it the big bad it's different yeah. i think and i that's like an interesting thing that just happens like i just realized the idea of him being chained down there's a lot of this imagery of the of like lucifer in paradise lost in there of like the fallen being dragged down into like this place yeah. and chained and stuff like that yeah just realize that at this moment that you can read it that way but yeah no that's um, why i love you raf because you're bringing up paradise lost and I, I you know that's like a book that i read once in college but i like aspire to be able to like make connections like that and you always bring them up and it's so interesting <laughs> Well, you should read it again. It's it has some very very powerful language in there that I just like. From the sheer enjoyment of the language, it's just an amazing poem. Paradise Lost by. Anyway, <laughs> let's not yeah, go no, there. I, I mean, it's actually one of the few books that I actually keep out next to my Dickens as like true uh, works of of literary art or whatever that I try and yeah. like I said aspire to uh, to understand. But I do think that you know the crippled God stuff is what kind of becomes explicit and it kind of sets up the end game for the rest of the books like exactly. um, what what's going on here i think it is interesting that he's kind of chained down and and you have a really good video actually talking about that and the different lenses that you can put on that stuff but uh you know it's also got the interesting kind of i think ending or approach to it which is kind of consistent in the rest of the books too but where ganos doesn't uh take as much of like a confrontational, I guess, approach to it, right? Because he ultimately um, lets him in the deck and all that and figures that like by kind of getting them to play by the same rules and all all that stuff, which is kind of yeah interesting because you expect more like full frontal, like how the hell are we going to kick this guy's ass kind of thing? Yeah, well, you know, there's, there's a different approach to that. Like, even if you look at it like uh, that, it's probably more confrontational. And that's something that you realize there's this scene in Capistan where they talk about that when they, when Ganas comes to the like conclusion that it might, or the realization yeah. more to say, I mean, that actually letting him into the deck of dragons um, puts, give like binds him to some Rains rules. Him in more. And, and, yeah, and, and like forces him to, to act within that structure, within those rules. And that's, I feel like an important thing there because before that, he's just doing something. There's this discussion with Gruntle and Quick Ben. I think it's there when they, when they're like, yeah. Until now, he's just been kicking out, kicking down everything, and not exactly playing by the rules. And if if he's actually joining the game, basically the the, the deck of dragons, he has to abide by the rules, and that makes it gives like everyone and like a fighting chance to actually deal with him or like rein him in in a way. That's interesting. Yeah. See, so I was looking at it as more like, wow, that's like kind of, uh, you know, nice of Ganos or they're being like more uh, benevolent than all out confrontation. But in some ways, it's actually just uh, a way to, to kind of keep them chained down in a in a different way. And somewhat it reminds me of your video about uh, Carson, like barbarism and all that stuff, how he just totally like um, casts off all those societal norms. And that's like where a lot of his power comes from, because everyone expects him to do one thing. And he's just like, yeah, I don't play by that like playbook or whatever. And uh, no yeah, one but, knows how to yeah. handle it. But the, I guess like the the different like the the special thing about Carsa is that he's unique because other people for it's other people would behave like that they would just be crushed down he's he's just very unique for all kinds of like other reasons he's very unique to actually go uh, to be able to get away with that kind of thing because yeah you can get away with ignoring rules for a while but unless you're just like an absolute badass like Carsa with with the divine backing and everything yeah. That it doesn't sooner work or later you'll well. actually come up against something yeah and even even which even the crippled god does right because then he has to uh start playing by the rules and actually he gets some like subjects right like uh calor and stuff who um you know don't end up ultimately uh getting the job done for him i guess or aren't as reliable mm -hmm. or as true of mm -hmm. of purpose for him yeah 
Yeah, that's true. I mean, I I feel with that, um, like, I mean, that's like the interesting thing there. The, the crippled God is not a willing participant in the whole thing. When you when you when you look at the like the prologue of Memories of Ice, he's been dragged down. I mean, yeah, yeah. he was apparently curious and got close, and then yeah. he got, got snagged. But he's he's not a willing participant in the whole thing. It's not him who started the whole thing. It's not him who started the shit. He he was just like collateral damage in a way that then like turned into something else. Yeah, totally. And that kind of brings me to my next point that I wanted to get your opinion on. And I brought this up when we did the uh, return of the Crimson Guard podcast with 10 very big books. And I, I always bring this up because I want to get people's opinion on this, but you know, it, it seems like that's, you know, if there was one kind of through line, if it's not the crippled God um, through all the books, even in some ways is like uh, Calor, right? Because he's the reason why the, these, you know, thaumaturgs or whatever, like try and bring down the crippled yeah. God in the first place to crush him. And then like, there's so much stuff, even like the whiskey Jack stuff, the silver Fox, all of that goes back to these like ancient times, the curse, the scrap with Draconis, the forging of Dragnipur and all this stuff in, in Carcanus could even arguably be attributed to Keller. Like he had to change up his plan and make the sword and do all this stuff because of that. What do you think of, of Kalor kind of being the, at the root of all this stuff? Um, I think there's a good, that that makes sense in a way. I mean, technically it's true, at least for the whole crippled God parts. Uh, yes, Kalor is at the root of it. Yeah. And I mean, I feel I often feel a bit of like, I feel bad for Kalor somehow. I mean, mm. I mean, when you look at Kalor and what he does and what happens then, it kind of follows that classical, classic Greek tragedy model of hubris being like at the root of everything. Because basically what Kalor does is like Kalor's big crime is hubris. It's expressed rather yeah. violently because it's it, like rather forcefully and physically but with him enslaving like an entire continent and everything yeah. but at the end of at the end of the day what it is is hubris and not wanting to give the gods what they deserve or whatever it's it's hubris the crime and that always comes with a fall when you look at great tragedy for example mm. and everything after that is him suffering through that one like the consequences of his first like these first actions which are you could see as hubris you could also see them as like the fundamental human drive to go out and um like manifest your own will onto the universe which is a very human trait in general and he just he just exemplifies that in a rather um um direct and extreme way but yeah. those two things coming together and i I guess you could argue that the whole idea of the Greek tragedy of the, the hubris before the fall kind of thing is just their way or artistic way to look at this like human drive to um, manifest your will and the consequences that come from that. So I think that's the way to look at it. It's like Keller does something very, very human. He yeah. just goes way too far and then he suffers the consequences from that. But he's, and that's, I think that's the difference between like that you have when you look at a lot of like tragedies, like, most tragic heroes at some point realize their mistake. Calor doesn't. Calor yeah. just keeps on pounding at it. Like, <laughs> and I, that's something that's very, like, very dear to me personally. It's like, he doesn't accept the rules. He just doesn't accept the rules of the universe. He just keeps going. I mean, he's, he's very bitter and angry because of yeah. it. I, I, I get that. He's, he's just like, no, why should you bastards dictate what I can do or can't do? I'll just keep on pounding at it and I'll try the next thing i'll try the next thing it's it's sort of like a, he's a very very angry sisyphus is yeah what I guess you could say <laughs> nice yeah that's interesting i saw in uh, ruth ann bad's most recent video he was talking about um you know just all of the uh the rules of warfare and all that stuff and proportionality. But uh, one of the things he just kind of mentioned off the cuff and didn't really touch on was how, you know, Calor might not have even been that bad of a, a ruthless dictator. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting hot take that I've never heard before that maybe he wasn't even that, uh, you know, authoritarian or something like that. And I was like, I'm, I, 
be interesting to to see him explore that because me i'm always like you know screw calor he is just like bitter especially like in the context of this book like i get everything you're saying that like Mm -hmm. you know he uh he's gone through all this crap and, you know, he's uh, never really changed. Right. He's not like repentant or whatever. And so he just like is more and more bitter as time goes on. Cause he's like, uh, you know, just really feels like he was Mm. uh, done dirty ultimately. And then you like see him in this book and it's like, he's just that guy who you're just meant to, to hate. Right. Because he goes after like these people. I don't know if you're supposed to like Silver Fox. I think you are supposed to be sympathetic to Silver Fox, but you know, like he takes out Whiskey Jack in this book. He's just like curmudgeonly, right? And old and cranky uh, yeah. and and trying to attack little kids at first before we know what's all going on there. So Calor is just such a, a, a hard <laughs> character. I hate that you try and make him more complicated for me to not like yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that's like the thing there is like, it's very easy to not like Keller in this book. And I totally get why everyone in that council is, in that war council is never <laughs> listening to him because he's just so, I don't know, the way he just voices his objections and those ideas might not be wrong. It's just more like him coming across as a bit of a dick, basically. And I'm like, yeah, you know, <laughs> I get it, but I also get why everyone is annoyed by this guy. Yeah. <laughs> at this point. And like the Silver Fox thing, well, I mean, I Silver Fox is I for me more complicated to get behind than actually um than Calor in a way. Yeah. I mean, we we do see other we do see other faces of Calor in other books. Yeah. Um about the Ruth and Bad thing. I have not finished Carcana, so I don't know if we get more about Calor no. as as a ruler. Okay, we don't because then like that's like the point. We don't know how he was as a ruler. Apparently, he was something of a dictator, but we don't know if he was a good dictator or a bad dictator. Or like, right? If he if he actually abused his populace before, like he just killed everybody. Right. I, I think we can all agree that killing like your entire country, uh, not so that no good. one else can. <laughs> so no one else it's a, it's a bit like those kids in like the sand pit that build a sand castle and then their parents tell them to let their little sister play with it as well and they just kick over the entire thing so they can't and the, it's kind of that thing yeah that impulse yeah. in there um so yeah i don't know he might have been a good ruler before that that's that's a big question that we don't know yet and that's might that might change or not change but like give us a very new perspective on calor but i i feel that in later books especially in Tolma Hounds, I yeah. feel he shows a bit more self-reflection because that's the thing in Memories of Ice. There's even in those situations yeah. where we actually get his point of view, he doesn't show any like real self-reflection. He's at the point where he thinks he's figured out everything. And that's a bad point when it comes to actually learning or self-reflections. Like if you already believe that you figured out everything, then you're stuck. Right. And then you're just sitting there going, everyone else is an idiot. Oh, these morons who can't figure out what I already know kind of a thing. Um, yeah, he's yeah. he's interesting. So why why do you think, I mean, why do you struggle with Silver Fox? Because I do too. And you've read all the Esselmont stuff as well, right? So you see how that all like plays out. But like the end of this book, especially, it's kind of like, you know, she's supposed to be aging. I guess she's only like a year or two old or something at the end of the book, really, in like actual terms or whatever. But she's supposed to have all these wise elder people. But it kind of seems like petulant, right? Like she basically just shuns the um, the yeah. the on eye mass. Well, that's that's like the interesting thing there. And there's like one point in Memories of Ice that gave me this time around because I kind of ignored it before, and I think I actually mentioned it in my recap video Mm -hmm. for that part where the point there is at some point it's mentioned i mean it's mentioned several times that she has all these different souls in her yeah i mean she has like night chill which is sister of cold night obviously she has um tatter sail in there she has belladon skull crusher in there and she has also the um the talani mass part of her soul in there the, the bone caster soul in there and the interesting thing there is that i for a long time i'm like looked at it from like the very like literal meaning of she's just got like this three or four souls in there and i'm like actually we all do have these different aspects of our soul when we, when you look at those um those souls that she has in there they're 
all of those were like as far as we got to see them which is very little actually because most of those like die really early on in gardens of the moon right but mostly those were like rather like apart from tattersail who has a lot of depth in there that gets ignored like is easy to overlook but right. apart from that they they are described rather one-dimensional in a way so it's not like there's like three or four fully formed like personalities in there it's just like one personality that has those three or four different aspects and they're warring within her and that, that's something i get because that's something i guess we all have we have like these different aspects of our personality we were yeah. like either are very caring and passionate which like compassionate actually which is more like the tattoo sale part you have the blind loyalty and wish to follow rules by the letter which would be more like your ballad and skull crusher aspect right. you have the, the 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 more cold will to i don't want to say will to power but you're more cold calculating aspects of your of your soul we have all of that in ourselves yeah and the the thing why she then like how she deals with the, with the clan and mass for me is just that thing about like for me the whole you can't talk about silver fox without talking about the maybe uh -huh. and the, the the situation there is that we basically see um what happens if parenting goes wrong because mm. silver fox while pretending to be super strong and all of that which is obviously forced on her by the Talani mass on the one hand, also by Kalor and how she's treated within the like um, the host of um, yeah. Calvin and Brood and everybody. She she doesn't have a childhood, right? There's right. there's a part there's a part of her that is a child, yes, and she doesn't have that. And there's a lot of just like disappointment and rage because of um, unrequited love in there in that situation, and she just throw something of a hissy fit there and we, because yeah. that's at that point at that point it's more like her overall child personality coming through it's like where were you she even like when she attacks Bran Cole she's like where were you all the yes. time my father yeah no that's, um, that, that's 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 sort of the thing that I feel makes her more human she tries she's at the bottom of her heart she's a good character she's a good person she wants to do right but she doesn't have the strength or doesn't have like her different like um as aspects of her soul in a way under control enough um, to actually have a an ongoing like more or less more or less monolithic personality which is something that you get with growing older it's like i wasn't yeah. when i was like i don't know even when i was like 20 i was <laughs> very irrational oh, yes. most of the time it's like <laughs> of course yeah. so to expect that from someone who has like had like two years to kind of grow into a comprehensive person that doesn't work Absolutely. No, that's such a, an interesting point. And actually, like, that's kind of like the, the fifth soul, right? Like everybody's trying to figure out like, what's the soul that's in there? Like, is it Tattersail? Is it like, it's like, what about the soul of this little girl, right? Who's just like yeah. a new, that's the one that nobody's, uh, they're like, oh, what about, you know, Ballardin and um, even Pran Cole's in there. And there's all these different souls. It's like, what about her being the, the little kid? And what that's about why- Silver Fox? <laughs> totally. And it, and it does, it comes out as like a, a kind of petulant thing at, at the end. And, you know, the Mybe thing is such an interesting point. Like, I think the Mybe is such a interesting plot line or whatever. And like, I feel like we're more sympathetic to the Mybe who kind of like gets a raw deal, but like as a parent, I relate to that. Right. Cause it's like, it does like take everything out of you and I can see you know it's not as bad for for me I live in like a male dominated society where like you know my wife still like for whatever reason does like a lot of the um, parenting stuff and nurturing aspects and whatever but it's like you can see like kids take and take and take um, this is happening on like an exponential uh, scale but it's like it's hard right because like on the one hand you get that internal monologue and I love that you get that like inner mind about the maybe being um you know caring and she wants mm -hmm. the best for her kid and all that but then you also see like she's bitter because it is like taking everything like physically and emotionally and it's like that's brutal um and it leads to the kind of consequences that you're talking about with silver fox mm -hmm. but it's terrible for the maybe too you know that's like that's struggles yeah. definitely like like one of the things i kind of thought about when i was like uh, reading it this time around is like do you have like in my experience, um, Erickson often works with these parallels where he has like two 
um, sort of symmetrical plot, not plot, uh-huh. but like things going on. And I feel that it's interesting to parallel the um, relationship between Silver Fox and the Maybe on the one hand and okay. the really broken um, um, parenting maternity kind of thing with uh, with the um, uh, change in Mal matron in oh. and talk at the uh, and talk the younger on the wow. other hand because both of those both of those are basically about a broken um, and um, non reciprocal love between parent and mother in a way like obviously it's kind of more complex with uh, right. my friend talk and the, yeah. and the Kachin Jamal sure. and the matron but it's it's in both cases, it shows that like both sides in, within such a relationship need something from the other, or need 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 something from the other. And in one situation, it's Silver Fox just taking and not giving. I mean, she's planning to give back, and that's like I guess the other big thing that you can take away from the entire book is like people should talk more with each yes. other and not about each other. Yes, <laughs> but you know, she she takes away she takes. All the time she takes literally like quite literally like the life force from the maybe which you know obviously is like a metaphor but you know yeah. and on the other hand on the other hand you have the the opposite situation where you have the the matron and right. she wants to give love all the time i mean she needs to give love to her children which don't exist anymore and she has talk and she and talk cannot take that love so you have like both both extremes of um of the parent um child relationship there you have on the one hand you have the the child taking more than the parent can give and on the other hand you have the the parent giving way more than the child can take and you know you have that also with with children like parents that are overprotective and all of that that both of those lead to problems (laughs) and that's what that's what memories of ice shows us when it comes to parenting advice yeah no and it's so good too because like you said you there's plenty of examples all you got to do is look out in your in your actual life right and you know people that either um just were take 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 from their parents and took advantage of every opportunity and always got away with stuff right and then you had those yeah. ones who were just constantly uh getting smothered and so it's that's what's crazy right it's like if you think about it it's like we're talking about like uh a uh, reptilian demon cl- clutching a, a human being with his eye blown out like to his her chest and whatever and then this mm. like uh you know soul that's all you know shifted together with multiple races and all this different crap going on and ultimately there's like life lessons that you bring back to your like real life yeah. uh, <laughs> that's just always such yeah, a like, gift that's i mean and Erickson kind of actually uh, like shows that in that one part of the dream of them maybe when she actually talks mm-hmm. to talk and they actually talk about it and you realize at that point that was for me this time around when i realized that there is this symmetry between those two like plot lines in a way it's like when they talk within the maybe's dream and he's like mother is terrible and um, the maybe's like but i'm a mother and you're like oh shit yeah, yeah. there's got something going on there that i maybe <laughs> ignored the times before that's what's cool and they're like even going on kind of like the same journey right that like we're all going on as people and and individuals and all that stuff and like the talk storyline and actually what you said about the just communicating right like kind of brings me to the talk storyline because i did this thing where i was telling everyone to give their like um stories about how you know malazan has touched their life or whatever but one of the ones that somebody said which is one that really resonated with me is that came not from the the kind of maybe storyline which you were saying that like the you know maybe and silver fox should have just like been more honest and open with each other and a lot of this stuff could have been um hashed out but was with the talk and tool thing at the end right where tool um kind of recognizes him talk doesn't recognize tool and it's like they miss that chance and just like it reminded this person to always uh you know make those connections and speak out and stuff like that. But that's kind of like a theme that was in there. But man, that was just such a crushing. Well, the whole talk storyline is crushing, but that especially when it's like they were just right on the cusp and you almost get that like happy ending where you're like, oh, the bros are going to like re, you know, group and bro out and all this stuff. And then you don't get it. So brutal. It is in a way, but you know, that's like the other thing though, is like tool makes that like conscious decision because he yeah. recognized he could just yeah. say something 
And the question there would be like, why doesn't why doesn't Tool say that? There might be something there about him kind of being ashamed about not being recognized or being ashamed about his like Talan Imas, like his Talan Imas past or uh-huh. something. I don't know, but that's that's like an interesting thing. But you're right, the talk storyline is is generally that guy gets shafted so many times, and I'm like, that's but there's a lesson in there as well. Like Tuck is one of those characters where you know that he's, um, how to say, um, where you know he's he's more like the average guy. And you have all yes. these high-powered people showing up and there's a bunch of them in Milazan. And I feel they are like the actual heroes of the story. Obviously, oh, yeah. they, they, they're they like the, the ones that you need to actually look upon because someone like Lady Envy has tons of power, but the person who, what is about it, who it really is that's that's talk because and she actually even recognized that in a way but yeah i feel talk what what i like about talk is like talk gets shafted every time <laughs> yes but he still manages he still manages to you know get so like get back on his feet all the time and take like sort of enjoyment about and stays human through yeah. all of that not only not only through gardens of the moon memories of ice but also later on but it's like talk is like all all the time he gets back on his feet again and again and again and has this like very um philosophical view of the world like he just looks at it like yeah let's let's keep on going it's all you can do totally yeah and i think like even you know people criticize talk like why did he just why didn't he just stay with envy in them right and like it makes no sense that he's gonna go in and try and like infiltrate the the panty and domin just to like get back to do jack but he's like one of those guys who lives by a code right and like i think even going back to gardens of the moon like at that moment at the dinner table or whatever when lauren is there and he like you know makes the decision to like uh lie for tatter sale i think it was or kind of like covered for her a little yeah. bit that he makes the decision like he's all in as a soldier bridge burner or whatever versus like the other like half of his his role and i think that like kind of undergirds all of all of his motivations or all of his actions yeah. throughout that is like he wants to go back and be with these people he's just a regular dude he wants to um and and it all kind of flows from there and i think it makes sense from that perspective Definitely. I mean, he's, I mean, I don't know, are we going spoilers all the way? Because then there's definitely stuff with talk that explains a lot of his stuff later on, but otherwise I'll keep that. Yeah, why don't because- we, uh, why don't we give the big giant spoiler warning that if you haven't gone beyond now, like, uh, you know, four five, six, you should probably bail out and we'll do the end game spoiler stuff from here on out. <laughs> we can do that. Yeah, definitely. Okay, cool. All right. So you were saying, <laughs> <laughs> so right yeah um so i feel like the the, the thing that drives talk is his as i said before he's a, like your average regular dude yeah but he he also struggles with that he start, struggles all the time with these feelings of um inequat- oh, fucking word um <laughs> um he feels that he's not like good enough like and right. that's why the ending like the actual ending of his storyline in crippled god is so powerful when he finally yeah. gets accepted in the bridge burners that's that's so powerful there because that's what he wanted to be all the time he wanted to be one of the guys all the time yeah and he obviously was one of the guys all the time but he couldn't accept it himself that's the point like he was a soldier like everyone is talking about him even yeah. gardens of the moon is like everyone is talking about him it's like yeah he's he's a soldier he's no longer a claw and everything Totally. He tries to he tries to live up to something that he's already lived up to a long time ago. And that's like I guess the other lesson that you could learn from from Tuck is that like this kind of not I mean he's basically he's 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 a character within the Malazan Book of the Fall and who suffers most from imposter syndrome basically yeah. he feels he has, all the time that he's not good enough and to, of course he is all the time but he doesn't he doesn't realize it until the end until someone finally tells him boy you've been a bridge burner all the time basically i know and the freaking poor guy he's the best he's like holding himself to these impossible standards and it's like bro you crossed the finish line uh ages ago and he just yeah that is 
the best when you see that end game finally play out. Cause like, man, he just, you know, you're right. It, I guess it's set up because he has just the most extreme stuff on, on the other side, but that's what I love about the bridge burner story too, is that that's like ultimately what it's all about. Right. And I think that's what makes like the empire so powerful and like self-sustaining, right. Is that it's all kind of like, well, a it's self-interested driven. Right. And so it's like, it's all when it's built on self-interest, like whoever takes over obviously has like, you know, the, the incentive to keep it going for their own selfish interest to be the ruler of a yeah. bigger and bigger thing or whatever, but also because these people like fight for each other at the end of the day, right? It's not like ultimately about like the policies and like the the global, the geopolitics that the people in UNTA are espousing or whatever at the end of the day, they're like holding the you know holding themselves to a code and fighting for each other and he's like the the epitome of that and to see him just like get you know inducted yeah is is pretty badass and i feel i feel that that's one of those things where you can very clearly see that that glenn cook black company influence mm. is basically in that thing because i don't know have you read black company at no this i haven't but everyone tells me all right I but to. That, that, that whole that whole brotherhood against the rest of the world kind of thing yeah is something that is very strong within the um, uh, within the Black Company books, even though they're all like super badass. But they're yeah. still like they're still like badass, mostly brotherhood against the rest of the world because they're used. I mean, they're within the Black Company. They're mercenaries, so they're used by everyone who pays them to uh, and hopes that they die at some point. Because obviously, you don't want to keep mercenaries on your payroll at the end of the war because they might just decide to go to uh, over to yeah. the other side because there's that's the mercenary problem but anyway um not not what i wanted to say about it. this idea of the brotherhood within the soldier within the so army good. is i feel a staple of military fiction or military fantasy military sci-fi definitely mm. and obviously with, uh, with with glenn cook it's inspired by his own experiences in vietnam and everything so there's obviously a truth to that that i as someone who has not been in the military, I has like no personal access to, but I right. think that's also to the depiction of that is something that made both uh, both Black Company and later on Malazan resonate so well with with veterans of whichever fighting forces you're talking about. Yeah, totally. And I think like same, I have no military background or anything like that. I have a bunch of military people in my family or whatever, but you know, I've been through intense like emotional situations nothing on the scale of of that but you can kind of um, extrapolate that out to like think about the kind of bonds and stuff that would form in in those kind of like extreme uh situations yeah. and like you know i love what a bro moment they have with talk and the handshake when he's like yeah you didn't sever your blood ties with your sister good enough and he thinks he's getting insulted he's like no bro because i could see you still care and they're like you know just that homies moment where they yeah like, you know do the classic kind of um high five moment i love i love the the talk stuff what about yeah. the whole Anna amanda rake and tist and east storyline because i know you're uh well actually i don't want to presume what do you think about all that stuff um all right i, I was just going to go in a different direction but okay what direction just... no let's do your stuff because it'll be <laughs> was, more was, interesting uh, wait well it will still lead us to the same result though because Perfect. i was going to say like the best example about that like whole idea of like extreme situations um creating like yeah. this spirit of the, the esprit de corps although i might i mean it in like a positive way right now not in a negative way that you can also take it but the point is um the the like the best example for that is whiskey jack telling anna a rake that mm. story about how the bridge burners yes. became the bridge burners because that's that's exactly the thing like um, experiences that you go through together, whether you're on the same side in that situation or not, yeah. are in hindsight very, very binding. And that's, I feel like another thing that I obviously don't know that much about because I'm not in that kind of right. uh, position. But if you hear like with like war, like um, fighting that has been a long time ago, and then you have like veterans from both sides talking to each other, they have so much to share because they went to this through that same like um, experience in a way. So there's that thing that you also see with Whiskey Jack and the yeah. Bridge Burners and Kalam and Quick Band. They're like, yeah, we're, we're now, we've, we've went through this crucible basically. We're now 
bonded together in a way that no one can take away from us. And that's like what that basically means, I guess. Yeah, no, totally. And they had that whole thing in the, um, I think where he's like remembering the battles and like the Mott Wood and the North of Guinnabacus or whatever, when yeah. they were like, um, you know, I think they were like playing chess or playing Keftin R and they were like shouting the moves back and forth, like from the foxholes, like across yeah, the, yeah. the front lines and that they had like established a code where they were like burying each other's dead. They had like built that mutual respect, even though, um, you yeah. know, they were basically killing each other too. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the, like I guess, like the, the the real world example for that would be that legendary mythical um, football game, like soccer football game during World War One at Christmas, when like the German and English people were like at Christmas, like having ceasefire. Oh my gosh! Playing playing football against each other during like the ceasefire during Christmas. Wow, See, I think that would be like the, the real world example for that. I guess. That's hilarious. I did not know about that. See, so Erickson could have mixed it up. He could have made him like playing sports or something. That would have been awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I guess what I was trying to say there is that there are real world examples for this kind of like, even during a war, soldiers mm -hmm. actually communicating with each other. And because their, their shared experience is so similar and so different from like their like actual like countrymen's uh, country people's um experience like if you're in the war in like a trench or whatever your experience is much more like the other like the your your enemy's perspective and experience yeah is th those are much more similar than like your experience and those of the people like behind the front at home that's yeah. i guess the point there it's like something that's very very difficult to communicate i mean that's where a lot of the trauma comes from is that you cannot communicate those things that you like went through. You cannot communicate that to um, like the people who were there. Nobody and, gets and, it, like, right? Yeah, I think exactly. even in like Return of the Crimson Guard, not to go totally a tangent, but I think it's like Stoop or somebody who tells Kyle, like, you know, we all think like we want to go home and then you like go there and you realize it's not home anymore and you like don't belong, right? Because like nobody yeah, yeah, gets exactly. it. You can't have those conversations and you can't put yourself back to the way that you were. Um, and so it, it never works out. That's actually why I buy the kind of um, Anamanda Rake, uh, Whiskey Jack friendship and bond. Like I've heard people say that that seems kind of like contrived or comes out of nowhere. They just have like this one, like, you know, big conversation at night, like having beers in the tent. And then all of a sudden they're like best bros forever and stuff. But like, yeah. For me, that's like kind of what you're saying kind of makes that believable for me because yeah. like Rake's been around the block and he knows that's, you know, he knows the words to that song or whatever. And and so it yeah. doesn't, you know, take much for him to be able to really connect with that. And that that's why I think like I love that friendship and don't think it's necessarily super contrived for that reason. No, it's not. Also, I mean, it's not going too super deep. It's more like that. Yeah, they share they share experiences, and you have that like really clearly in that situation with the uh, women of the Dead Sea, where mm. Rake wants to protect Whiskey Jack from having that experience that he already has, and that Whiskey Jack apparently didn't have before. Yeah, and that's that's sort of that thing there um, about Whiskey Jack and Rake. I just I made that joke somewhere it's like whiskey jack seems to run like a diplomacy bar because every time like near the end of memories of us every time there's difficult discussions that need to be had he's like i have this cask of grateful ale in my tent <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> how much beer does the guy carry around i know and he's like always <laughs> sober he's not like even enjoying it poor guy I well, love to be fair, we never we we never actually see them actually drink it. Maybe it's like every time because it we always change perspective before they actually broach that cask. So maybe it's just that one cask and whiskey jack just really wants is really thirsty and, he and just, really wants to drink that beer. He never gets to because every time he actually picks it up, Steven Erickson decides to just change the scene and we get something else. And that's yeah. I don't know. I know that poor guy. Well, hopefully he's getting like a uh, Trigel Trade Guild um deliveries now in hood's realm or i don't know if that's what it's going to be it's going to be called anymore but uh that that will be yeah you know, he, he still has a chance to maybe find that and and crack it open i think <laughs> yeah i hope so <laughs> maybe, <laughs> that's, he, maybe that's he, how it goes he deserves it and he earns it but uh i think this is like a, a cool 
um, foreshadowing. Well, I guess it started in Dead House Gates too, but like you really see the bridge burner start to ascend to that final end game piece in this one too. I guess like the Tano Spirit Walker was really the first piece, right? Where he like enchants that spell and sings the song of the bridge burners, but then also like it comes to a head obviously when Ganos like blesses them and they're all entombed in the moon spawn yeah. and all that. I just I just love the fact how how like it's like I didn't pick up on the first time like maybe on the second time but definitely on the third time it's like how tricky that like that situation with Kimlock is and he's like yeah I just I would just need to touch you and Fiddler says I don't want that yeah and he's like all right and then at the end he just puts his hand on his shoulder and I, like, I know and then he's like all right bye and does it anyway at the very end and kind of like molests him anyways yeah that there's something to be talked about there that let's not open that can of worms but yeah that's interesting although that's something i i spoke about yesterday i think is like this idea because i was just talking about the house chain situation where loric explains to heberic that the bridge burners are on the verge of ascending because of that spirit walker song and, oh raf let uh, me interrupt you and get you to scoot to your left like six inches i wasn't paying attention to your screen there you go perfect yeah <laughs> all right now sorry i was like moving should i actually switch on the light because i feel it's getting darker no you're perfect actually your lighting looks right. great you're a star <laughs> perfect all right now what i was going to say is um the um situation so loric uh, talks to Heboric and says about that says that and he's like yeah but a tano spirit walker's song needs to be like elliptical it needs to be it, it needs to end like and where it starts so that's huh. why someone that's why a bridge burn needs to go back to a rock to for it to work and I just love that because we also know that Steven Erickson has said that his writing style is elliptic and we can look at that it's like a lot of yes. these things are circular like you know even the, the old the entire book ends in Malazan again so there's this parallel of the Tano Spirit Walker writing this song about the bridge burners which is sort of the same thing happening when you look at the Malazan book of the fall which starts and ends at the same place yeah no that's true and like even the individual books you know it like kind of um goes yeah. full circle in a lot of ways which is really uh interesting and i love that tano spirit walker thing we had the whole mage tournament i thought uh kim lock would have gone a lot farther in that although that one was brutal there was just a lot of crazy matchups but that is powerful you know what i mean like even just what it did in that one moment when fiddler broke the shell that was like when he thought it was the cusser and he smashed it and it just like crazy tidal wave in the desert <laughs> Yeah, but you know, the, the idea of singing magic is also one of those things that you have that super powerful. I mean, obviously you have it in, in, in Tolkien with the whole idea that your entire world was basically sung into into being in the Silmarillion. Mm. And he takes he takes that from like from the Finnish mythology from the from the Kalevala, where uh -huh. all the magic where all the magic is done by singing. And it's there's this amazing story at the beginning of the Kalevala where there's these two guys, uh, their main guy and like the main character of the of the whole story who has the the most epic mic drop in mythology ever but <laughs> that's not good no, seriously it's amazing he's like okay you want christ well i'll leave you my cantle and i'll just leave you bastards alone <laughs> but he, here's the thing is so they they're driving on this path like on obviously on sleighs with probably reindeer i don't know it's finland and <laughs> one of them has to obviously make room for the other one to pass and they're like getting into a beef and uh -huh. the entire combat the entire battle is not fought by swords it's fought by them singing at each other and that's how magic yes. works in that finnish mythology is people singing spells the idea that's of singing awesome. comes from there i, I suspect that's and it's just pretty cool, cool. That is cool yeah he's obviously very well read and that's what i love about the the kind of personal backstory of him right is that he has that kind of deep roots and studying all these different cultures yeah. and civilizations and he really like writes that in i always get the like uh, deep character stuff even though people say he's terrible at characters i think like it just depends on how you like yeah. your your characters because there's a lot of a lot of meat there i think yeah i mean he's he's good with characters in general i have issues with some characters i just made that video on on what i think is the problem with rake and whiskey jack because i have problems with whiskey yes. jack as a character um but in general no the, the character work is good i mean for fantasy especially yeah 
Yeah, no, I, I love it. Like there's moments and people, you know, I think it's just, there's different readers that are looking for different stuff. Cause like somebody said that like, oh, I read Dead House Gates and I felt nothing for any of the characters. I was like, man, that was the one that like hits, you know, kind of one of the hardest for, for me, but whatever. So I get it. I think it's just different strokes for, for mm, different yeah. folks. One of the things I did want to get your take on, cause like, you know, I think this is kind of an undercurrent of, and you talked about like mirror mirroring storylines or like these, you know, kind of different aspects. But I think like the human story in this is kind of a mirror to the Talon Imas story, obviously. But like this book or the Memories of Ice book in particular, you get this kind of like long drawn out feudal war between the Imas and the Jagat. That's just so it seems to me so stupid. Right. And like the vow, like so much stuff stems from this, like the, you know, Kala the whole Panny and Seer stuff starts because mm -hmm. Kalava yeah. feels bad and wants to save the Jagat and stuff. And they like, you know, all the environmental degradation that happens because they just like, overbreed so that they can wage this war. I don't know. It's just, it seems like uh, that's one of the big undercurrents of the whole series is like how stupid this thing is. Um, yeah, I think for that, like an important quote is it's in memory of ice somewhere. I just, I think it's actually tools saying that. Mm. I, I'm not quite sure there's this discussion that where someone looks at like the prairie is like, oh, this looks so peaceful. It's like, no, everything in oh, nature yeah. is at war. Yes. That's, that's like, that's the baseline for that. Like Tulan Imas, Jack had story. And then like later on the human story is always about the idea that life unchecked, um, that your apex predator, if you want to call it that way, is if unchecked will just overextend himself or themselves and, um, that will fall into ruin. And that's what the IMAS did with the Jack Hut in a way. That's what the humans are basically doing at the moment. It's even more brutal when you look at Midnight Tides and the, the more like economic terms you put it into when you go to Midnight Tides. But th that's like the main thing there is that like whatever being, if unchecked and if too powerful, yeah. will overextend itself and thus create its own ruin in a way. And that's like the thing with the Talan IMAS there. It's like the Talan IMAS have kind of died like a long time ago and that's like the other image there's like the, there's the idea of emptiness and like pointlessness of just going through the motions because <laughs> yeah. of it and obviously there's, there's like a lesson for like real human life in general in there obviously and right i feel that's something that is like Okay, so th there's a bunch of things going on there, but one thing that I found very interesting is like the idea of the entire book called Memories of Ice. Yeah. And like, obviously, we near the end, we get all these situations where it gets like very obvious when you have all the Tulana mass memories being like pounded into the ground in the form of hail and stuff like that. Um, but the other yeah. thing about that is like ice is a very, very powerful thing. We, we've seen that in like the imagery, like the memories yes. of ice um this ice is very powerful this breaks up stuff ice is a very destructive uh, force because it is so powerful it can crack rocks and shit like that you yeah. know yeah and cover continents and wreak total destruction and yeah yes and that that then binds into that general thing that theme that you have going through the entirety of the malazi book of the fall and mm. that is like I think it's at the beginning of Gardens of the Moon already. It's like this idea that history and remembering and that history is always influencing what's happening at the moment. Like all this past, all these memories are the reason why such destructive things are happening right yeah. now. It's, it's always these memories of ice basically that come and just Totally. Yeah. And it's just, you know, it's so you could draw like all these interconnected lines, right? Like that, uh, that, uh, I think it's always sunny in Philadelphia where the like conspiracy theorist has like the board and he's drawing all this stuff or like, because it really is like they, you know, they wage all this war, they loot, they, they can't see the forest for the trees, right? It's like, you want to wage all this war so that we can survive so that we don't get taken over by the Jag hut. But it's like, for, for, to what end, right? For what? They're not like living life and like breeding and having kids and like doing any of the stuff. And so it's like, just for the sake of like being the, 
the apex predator or whatever and it's just uh it's really it's really sad and this you know like i said the whole panion well, that's, thing that's, that's kind of the same thing that happens with color in the end as well mm. right i mean he's, yeah he's he's also just going through the motions at this point he just and he's never gonna win he's never gonna whatever but he just still keeps tr trying he takes the throne because he's like ah throne's a throne i'll take it he's like i just want to be on it you know and it's like well, on, a, on a very practical level a throne is a throne right As, i mean yeah, true yeah <laughs> I'd, and, I'd take one if you'd offer it if you offer it to me but you know totally like, and i think that's probably I, like the moral of the story right is that it's like it's not you know it's like to what to what end it's like what is the what is the logical conclusion of of all that yeah. stuff right yeah that's what true. about but, no go ahead um yeah I, i'm not quite sure what i wanted to say at this point the well i know one thing that i did want to get your take on which is um kind of both memories of ice related and um end game or just like bigger picture related is crawl right because um, oh yeah you, you know what what is crawl's i'd love to hear your take on just like what crawl's plan is right because it's like he's waging a war on multiple fronts and i'd love to hear like obviously as the front of like the immediate resistance he talks about the whole um tist e dur like i think um i i forget i think it's in his meeting with envy during memories of ice where he talks about um there's another ship coming up or there's another threat but that one threat at a time or whatever so he kind of has yeah. like these immediate here and now threats but then he also has like a long game was it the same kind of like does it oh what's the venn diagram look like with him and like shadow throne um and you know did his end game picture it doesn't seem like it looked the same as what shadow throne's plan was which was to ultimately um you know do what they did i guess i don't know how bad i really want to ruin the end game but <laughs> No, no, no. Um, well, I don't, I don't know exactly. I feel like the one thing that you can take away from that in general mm. is um, that when you look at the whole idea of how the how the pantheons, both the elder and the normal, like the younger pantheon, how they interact with with humanity, you have a bunch of people who come out sort of on top at the end, and those are the ones that actually work with humanity. Mm. And I'm, I'm using humanity in a broad sense here. Like yeah. I feel, in the end, you should like take all of those yes. different species that are like active within. You just take them as persons, right? Right. That, that's my take. It's like it doesn't matter if they're like, I don't know, conscious dinosaurs with swords or not. It's like they're agreed. They're they're people. Yes. And the thing that you take there is like the people that come up uh, come out on top at the end are basically male um crow shadow throne and cotillion mostly mm -hmm. and those are the ones that associate with with humanity and take humanity seriously for like serious for yeah. various reasons like on the one hand it's um um obviously because they were human yeah at some point and on the other hand is people is because people associate they associate with people and then get their human perspective and that's yeah, they take cues from humanity in some ways. Exactly. They, that's the point. They they work with humanity and not against it. Or they, they see the value in it. humans. Exactly. They, they 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 take and that's like I think that's vitally important for the entire series because the interconnected like the, the relationship between humans or like people and gods mm. it goes both ways. And, P and definitely. Gods, gods who realize that and you can you can see that very clearly especially like in the later books when you look at the errand and how or yeah. upon, or upon on the other hand as well those people who try to enforce their will on humanity that doesn't work but that also means like they those gods become more human in a way like obviously shadow throne cotillion a superhuman male is like the most one of the most human characters in the entire book yeah uh, and carol is also rather human in a way or rather humane in a way and that's they they use the same methods they treat on the same level on the same playing field in a way and use the same like interactions and that's how that works and that's yeah. why or i'm not sure if like Corolla has that super clear long game at yeah. the end if for me it feels like he's because he's closer to humanity in a way he's much more open to improvise in a way mm. about these yeah. things it's like He's like, yeah, I know this thing is coming, but let's deal with this right now because 
there's going to be some plan to go with the rest once it happens but he's much yeah. more this more improvising kind of god which obviously makes sense because he's more associating with um with with Krupa. yeah Krupp, however yeah. you want to call him yeah uh, that guy totally who is also much he, he's he's sort of a mastermind but i feel he's more like a mastermind because he's able to improvise on the spot mm-hmm. and yeah. and shadow throne has the ability to i suspect improvise and make it look like he had a plan all along yeah and rely on other people who actually take things seriously i feel more i feel i'm very close to shadow throne that is like i have crazy ideas and then i rely on other people to actually get things done and yeah. shadow throne is very much doing that with dancer or like cotillions like someone actually has to make sure shadow throne gets what he planned because someone actually has to do like the the detailed stuff and yeah shadow throne just doesn't totally. look at details and no, I, Kroll I, does look at details, I suspect, but he's also very much open to take things in their stride and improvise with what he has at the situation. So I, I don't know if he has a long game during Memories of Ice that is like more like better formulated than just like we need to actually get the infection of the Warren solved because that's her like killing me. Yeah, no, totally. I love it. And I think you're, you're absolutely right. I think they all kind of have like this, like bowling bumpers type of thing. You know, it's like, if you ever go to the, the bowling alley, they can like put up the bumpers for the kids where it's like, it doesn't make you bowl a strike every time. All it does is just like keeps the ball, yeah. uh, you know, in the, in the kind of play, field of play, yeah. if you will. And I think the other thing that, that it kind of brought up as you were talking about that is not only are they the one, you know, those four, the ones that interact with, with humanity more they're also kind of the ones that absolutely get i think the limits of godhood and ascendancy too but which the Aaron doesn't get you know it's like they very much are are kind of um have the yeah. wool pulled down over their own eyes in the sense that they're gods and everyone else has the worshiper but it's like male gets manhandled up around by by the gistal right and gets forced to do all this stuff that he doesn't really want to do crow has had to go hibernate because he like faded into irrelevance for a while yeah. there yeah. Um, and shadow throne and cotillion took it and they know somebody else could take it from them if they want and so they get like the kind of ephemeral nature yeah. of it maybe so that's a, a kind of that's... other thing too is like you better play ball or else um, you're not as powerful as you think you are kind of thing <laughs> so they're just maybe also more pragmatic yeah. Also, if you look at it, like those four are the ones that interact with humanity very indirectly. Mm. They never impose, like almost never impose. They, they, they make, they make offers and hope that people take those offers. They never go and like forceful, mm. yeah. because that's the thing that that also like the the entire book teaches you. And like Ganwa's parent is sort of the the main um, proponent of that. Is if you tell humanity to not do x or to do y they're going to go the opposite way they're going to do their own thing because yeah people are stubborn and those four are the ones that kind of realize that that's not the way to do it. it's like you to give them opportunities and you nudge them in a way which is interesting that i use the word nudge here but um yeah you know um you you, you can very indirectly and um very very um Um, covertly, you know, show people which way to go, but you can never just force people. Force, brute force doesn't work with, with humanity as a whole. That's a sad truth. Yep. Yeah. And I think Kroll is a perfect example of that. And when he meets with Envy, you know, and he goes here, look, here's the score, right? Here's all this stuff that's going down. He's like, this is why I need you to do this. This is why we brought yeah. together and all that stuff. And he goes, it's because the Warrens are infected. And she like, I think he does the big reveal actually, which I think is one of the best explanations of the magic system and how his heart works and the veins and all that, which is like, yeah. I think in book two or book three or whatever, um, but yeah, and she when, goes, when why she you goes, tell me this yeah. to like hold me hostage and force me to do it because I use your magic or whatever? And he's like, no, I'm just trying to like tell you what's up so that hopefully you'll like um, realize that that we all have a yeah. shared interest here. Well, yeah, I mean, the whole character character of Envy is like an interesting mm-hmm. one because on the one hand, she's using the magic all the time. We never see her actually suffering from infected wounds. Yeah. I mean, she's she's blowing out tons of magic and oh, she's yeah. not suffering she's not suffering at all so she probably has some i don't know maybe l maybe elder and magic wasn't actually infected that much and that's why she can do it i don't know yeah um, it's a big mystery 
Um, but I feel that the main thing there is like, she's this, she's like Ericsson's version of the trickster god in a way. <laughs> it's even like said at some point, I think it's Tuck says like the trickster gleam in her eye. The, the trickster is like very important in those pantheons. It's like, they're like willful, but they're fundamentally not evil. And she's not evil. Yeah. She's just very, very selfish and willful. But at that point, when she sees what the score actually is, uh-huh. she because that's the point like the trickster is not actually really evil that the trickster re- realized that they're like the, the trickster likes to you know um like push over some like figures on the board but the trickster doesn't want to like tear apart the entire board because the right. trickster enjoys playing the trickster enjoys playing so much and when you show him that what currently happening will destroy the entire game the trickster right. will actually try to help because he enjoys the game so much Totally. And that's that's why that's why Kroll goes that way with envy. I feel. Yeah, he's like, hey, this is an existential thing, and then she's like, well, who am I gonna go around and annoy and pull strings and do all that and manipulate yeah. if there's uh, if there's nothing no there. nothing left? That makes sense. What about her yeah. whole deal with uh, the chaining and Decem and how Hood might not have taken his daughter and all that? Do you have any takes on that? I read that stuff this time around, and I'm like, I still just. I know there's multiple chainings, like I guess every time a new chunk of the cripple god turns up or whatever. Um, but I, I never mean, totally get got that stuff. And even more confused after going back and reading Path to Ascendancy and seeing like, was that the daughter that everyone's talking about? This like girl that was in the, t- you know, I don't know. What do you think about all that stuff? I really don't know that much about it. It's like yeah. I'm not I'm not the one who goes like I don't know through pages and pages and pages of reddit posts about lore and stuff like that yeah we need no frog um, to do a text wall for us on that Nif- Rock would do a text wall for that yes, yes. but the, the the point there i feel is why it's brought up there is um that it's i mean one i don't think the that girl from path to ascendancy is not dasim's daughter i don't okay. think that because that the the age difference doesn't make any sense right yeah exactly she's not that he's he's pretty young at that point and she's not that much younger than him yeah no no i think that's a different thing okay good the main situation there i think why it's brought up there is the idea to show envy that there's consequences to even to selfish willful behavior there's consequences yeah that's something that you need to bring home apart from that i have no idea how the all of that works because we I don't know much about the whole chaining thing, how that how chainings work. Apparently, a lot of people show up somewhere wherever that is, and mm. blow out a ton of magic, and yeah. <laughs> then it kind of works. I feel it's sort of like your your like like your channel build situation where you have to put like another layer of of concrete on the on the whole thing every I don't know okay. 20, 30 years because it's starting to crack up again. Yes. It, that that's that's how I imagine it for me. It's like why why you need more chainings. It's like the power is so virulent, you need to just go back and keep hitting it again and again. <laughs> sort of keep- like that, yeah keep zapping it with the stun gun and just keep uh, holding it down that's funny yeah exactly so, something like that yeah that basically the idea is that with if envy would have been there it would have been much easier and i have no idea what hood did with Dasim's daughter i i just i just really yeah. don't know maybe, maybe we'll find out at some point i mean we know that she's apparently lying in a dead house in the yeah, exact true. somewhere yep. we saw that um which I don't know if that means she's dead or she's just sleeping there. We don't know. I, I just really don't know. Timeless nap. Yeah. I hopefully we'll get that fleshed out. He's like one of the biggest enigmas, honestly. There's so many questions around that, but I guess that's uh that's where we recruit uh Niflrog to to jump in and explain a lot of this stuff to me. Yeah, I I, I just actually reached that point in uh, in House of Chains yesterday with uh uh-huh. when Cro- when when Cutter encounters uh Wonder Traveler yes. for the first time and Traveler gets that sword that is both vengeance and grief which obviously is like you know like w- on your second read through you just know that's the perfect sword for him. Oh yeah, it's perfect. That's him, right? So <laughs> Yeah, that, that that seems like vengeance and grief in one person, and you need like a a a, a focused singular will to wield it, and that's like yeah, that that's yeah, no, nope. that's that's how it goes. 
hundred percent. Well, I'm flipping through my notes and I see that I hit all my major like plot points. I'm sure that we already chased away everybody who hasn't read past memories of ice by now, but uh, this was under the auspices of memories of ice. Is there any other memories of ice stuff that we should have talked about that we didn't? Um, maybe the ending. I oh, yeah? feel like, I feel like, um, the general thing is like, we, we always talk about this whole empathy and compassion thing mm -hmm. and memories of ice. I feel is the first time this fully comes also fully comes to fruition, which yes. may be one of those reasons why people think memories, why for a lot of people, memories of ice is their favorite book. It's like yes. memories of ice in general is sort of the entire series in miniature because it has like those main things because at the end the seer is he's not redeemed but he's actually given a chance to redeem himself yeah um that's he that's starts down one that thing path. that i feel is important to, to look at. it's like there's two things in that's important it's like one he doesn't you know just get killed and that's it you don't throw the ring into the volcano and wait for him to die no he gets a chance to actually do something about it and that's the second part it's like he gets a chance to do it because once he realizes what he has done he's like i don't deserve your compassion there's like you know but here's a chance for you to actually do something so you can earn that compassion and that empathy from us and that's i feel yeah. that's why memories of ice the ending works so well because you feel like the main like the main gut punch is obviously when whiskey jack dies and it's like yeah. that's the gut punch sure and that's not even the last chapter and that last chapter is the longest chapter by a large bit it's like basically twice the length of any other chapter in the right. book there's like how is he going to deal with that? He just killed Whiskey Jack, who he's built up to be this amazing like character that everyone yes. likes. And I'm like, <laughs> what's he going to use those next four and a half hours in the audiobook? That is uh, those next four and a half hours for. Yeah, and yeah. You get like some cool action scene with like people drive flying in on helicopters, which you know, not helicopters, but basically the same thing, just right. in um, <laughs> insect form. But you know, <laughs> you get a bunch of com yeah combat stuff. But then you also get that point. It's like they finally get the Panion Seer and then they give him a chance to actually work his thing off because the game is bigger. It's bigger than yep. just personal vengeance. Yeah. It's even bigger than like, I don't want to say national, but it's, you know, it's, it's even bigger than vengeance on a continental level. It's, we're talking about the, the fate of the entire world and he might actually help us there. And if he can do that, yep. then that's a good thing and to see the, the human element in him, in him and to see that he was used badly yes that's that's something that i feel is important and the fact that it's shown this early within the series reflects like the entire thing like in miniature what happens overall in the series to realize that yeah. things are not as straightforward as you may may think when you look at it absolutely and that's why i love going back to the prologue and it's so important and powerful you know what i mean because it's like it's all, like he was done dirty and it's like it's all about consequences and that's a big theme as well right is that there's all these like um in economics the econ nerds we call them uh multiplier effects right but it's just like yeah. the the ripple effects that go out from any individual uh action you know and again it goes back they yeah. did this vow she wants to bail the vow there um she feels bad for this endless war against the jacket she tries to show compassion she totally screws it up and like chucks him into this rent that freaking totally tortures him and um and then leaves him open to this being manipulated and used and abused by yeah. you know which is like that's what what happens broken people are the ones that get preyed upon by other people who want to use them for bad stuff right and that's what happens here and uh, but they don't yeah, just go out and, and kill them and murder them that's what's so cool about the books right and that's not the the end game it's like to bring them around and uh and yeah, that's, that's like that's what's like cool the, the other thing there's like broken people get preyed upon that's yeah true but other on the other hand broken people also are depending on what you're going for the the people that do the praying because that's yeah. the way i mean you look at it. Who, who's who's preying on the Panion Seer? Who is broken? Well, it's it's the crippled God who is broken. Also, it's like true misery, misery perpetuating itself all the time. That's 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 the evil there. That's interesting. Yeah, that's very cool. 
And, you know, it ultimately ends up, uh, you know, you see like even those most evil people, right? That he finds that compassion, that humanity, they have like that kind of might be parallel, right? Where it's like, mm-hmm. let's set the sister up and and kind of uh, find some kind of like redemption or like you said, starting down that path towards earning the the compassion and empathy and all that. Yeah, but as I said, like the, the, the important thing for me there is that it's actually the, the seer who can decide if he wants to be redeemed or not. <laughs> Mm. to give him the chance that's that's vitally important because that's give him a choice to actually do something because he didn't have that many choices up to that point yeah yeah no you're and right Gosh. the power of choice is very important there and that's like a big part of it too that's why the god of uh chance is so interesting too right is because it's like you know all it's just like all these little nudges and choices create all these different that's why i love the the sci-fi stuff where it's like the multi or whatever the million worlds and all that where it's like each you know um choice yeah. is like a branch point of different new possibilities and whatever exactly that's true very cool well raf thank you so much for coming on i know we um i could talk to you all day honestly like every time i bring something up you bring up a different point that's even more interesting than the one i wanted to talk about so uh, oh, the one thing i want to do is get point. you on the record saying that you'll come back for another oh, one of course it will okay <laughs> we cool. can talk about we can talk about more of like i don't know let's let's talk about midnight tides at some point yes that's what i really want to do so i'm trying to jam through my memories of ice so that i can just blow through house of chains which isn't my most favorite to get to midnight tides which is uh high up there so i'll aspire to catch up to this yeah. voracious well, reading pace you're the economist and the you're the economist here you're you love obviously midnight tights because that's all economy basically i know i'm i'm just waiting to get there so that i can make my video called the bug short um to just go <laughs> after that, that. cool that good thing. so um, <laughs> well at this at this at this point with the whole GameStop thing you can even pull in more like current stuff in there that would be cool I know. Well, dude, it's just like, it's bugs time to shine right here. It's bug into holes time to shine. So, but uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and leave it there. I'm going to link down below to Raf's channel. I suggest that if you made it this far that you should definitely go over there and click the the subscribe because uh, there's like, you know, constant good stuff out here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank, thank you so much for having me. All right, cool. And uh, we'll leave it there. Like, subscribe, do all that good stuff. And we will see you on the next one.